Thank you for the question, but I really, re I'm sorry, but I reject the premise. Uh, these students How do you camp, reject the premise? These students, Are these pictures lying? Can I, are these pictures, are can, any of these people in jail? Can I finish my statement? No, are any of these people in jail? Are any of these people arrested? LAPD is working on trying to identify the people who were assailants that evening. We were committed to finding out the people that it's were involved It's been here. over a month. I submit for the record uh, an article that starts, uh, the CNN has produced. Without objection. Why did you not immediately send the police that were standing by, your campus police, law enforcement, to intervene? We tried. We, we notified, as soon as we saw the violence, we notified uh, all of our mutual aid partners. We tried to get police there as quickly as possible. But going back to my original point, so this encampment was against policy. This violated time, Chancellor, place, time place, Chancellor, and manner. if I may, the footage from that night reveals that some of the most dramatic attacks were carried out by individuals not affiliated with UCLA, not the university students, faculty, that were arrested. Why have the violent agitators, who you know have been identified, not been held a, a, a accountable for assaulting over 150 of your students? You should be ashamed in the fact that you failed your students. You should be ashamed for letting a peaceful, protest gathering get hijacked by an angry mob. You should be ashamed for allowing such violence to take place on your campus, which will now be weaponized by Republicans in this committee. Our nation's welfare programs continue to trap Americans in a perpetual state of dependency on government assistance. These programs are allowing too many able-bodied adults to sit at home, resulting in major workforce shortages, and driving costs up for businesses. The culture of dependence must be replaced with the culture of self-sufficiency and personal responsibility. We need to restore the dignity of work and the work ethic in this country, not just because it's a fiscal matter, because it's good for people to use their God-given talents to contribute to our great country. The idea that because somebody is on a government program, that they are going to stay on a government program forever is not something that exists. Is there are many countries around the world who provide government assistance where people are not constantly on welfare. We have to provide the bootstraps if we are saying people need to pull themselves up. I didn't come to Congress to be silent. I came to Congress to be their voice. And my leadership and voice will not be diminished if I am not on this committee for one term. My voice will get louder and stronger, and my leadership will be celebrated around the world as it has been. So take your vote or not. I am here to stay, and I am here to be a voice against harms around the world and advocate for a better world. President Biden and my friends across the aisle want to continue to exceed America's credit card limit without any consideration of how or why we got here. Since the first day of the administration, this Biden administration has recklessly spent taxpayers' dollar. And as a result, as I say, you see inflation at record highs, stealing money and opportunities from hardworking Americans. The three main pillars of this legislation will benefit hardworking Americans by limiting federal spending, saving taxpayer dollars, and growing the economy. Overnight, they dreamt up a dangerous economic bill that will blunch families into economic depression. Republicans say they want to grow the economy, but their bill will destroy 8,000 8, jobs in my district alone and 7 million across this country. They say they want to invest in children, but this bill eliminates childcare access for 4,000 kids in my state and 180,000 nationwide. Student loan forgiveness is nothing more than a transfer of wealth from those who willingly took on debt to those who did not or had the grit to pay off their loans. For two years, President Biden has attempted to push a free college agenda through radical regulations, including income-driven repayment, executive actions like blanket 
cancellation and his permanent pause on repayment. Some of my colleagues on the other side are fine with accepting millions of dollars in PPP loan forgiveness for themselves and are always ready to bail out corporations, but draw the line at providing financial relief to individuals struggling with student loan debt. If you can get past the shock of how cruel this is and ask why, you will see the answer is to simply score political points and nothing more. I will just say as an immigrant on a personal note, you know, when we arrived in the US in 1995, it took my dad about two weeks to find employment. He worked at the airport and then became a cab driver. We moved to Minnesota. He worked for the post office until he retired in 2010. I was expected to find a job to help support the family. So were all of my six siblings. All of us have been gainfully employed since we were 16 in this country. The idea that immigrants do not come to this country desperately searching to reach that American dream is ridiculous. And it's something that I find abhorrent that is constantly discussed as we come to this country to just be on public benefits when we desperately want to be as equal as every other person and be gainfully employed and live the American dream. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm truly shocked that we're having this hearing today. Not only um, was the budget resolution uh, due on April 15th, uh, but we're in the midst of a shutdown crisis because Republicans can't even organize their own caucus to pass funding levels that we already agreed to. And now they launch some of the most radical cuts to healthcare, to housing assistance, to food assistance, to the postal office, and nearly every program under the sun, all while doing nothing to rein in our nearly trillion dollar Pentagon budget or the trillions they have handed out to millionaires and billionaires through the Trump tax cuts. On top of that, they defund enforcement of high earning tax cheats. In his opening remarks, the chairman even said, we don't need an army of IRS agents. Well, guess what, Chairman? Increasing tax enforcement would raise over a trillion dollars over the next decade, according to the most recent research. So you have to ask, who stands to benefit from all of this? Well, it turns out millionaires look out for one another. It's the Republican members of this committee, at least nine of whom are millionaires, according to the latest data from Open Secrets. That includes Buddy Carter, who has vocally pushed to slash Medicaid and take away health care from his constituents, who himself is worth $33 million. And it includes Rolf Norman, one of the most extreme advocates for, ta for taking away food assistance from working people who's worth whopping $43 million. In his opening remarks, the chairman said, there's a difference between the president's priority and ours. He is right. President Biden is worried about taking care of the country. The president is about making sure the economy works for everyone that kids have enough food to eat, and that millionaires and billionaires pay their fair share. As Humphrey once said, the moral test of government is how it treats those who are in the dawn of life, the children, those who are in the twilight of life, the aged, and those who are in the shadow, shadows of life, the sick, the needy, and the handicapped. Clearly, Republican co colleagues are failing that test. Thank, Thank you, you and I yield back. The recent images from UCLA are appalling. What is more appalling is that there was complete, it was completely preventable. You could have, have prevented this by protecting the diverse groups of pro-Palestinian students that were peacefully gathered on campus to share meals, stand in solidarity against a brutal genocide, you could have prevented this by protecting these students' First Amendment right to assemble. You could have prevented this 
when you learned about rats being released into the encampment, you could have prevented this when there was a anonymous group funded and constr uh, constructed, a, again, a giant video with loudspeakers to play vile and disturbing footage. You could have prevented this when you saw an angry mob on campus on the night of April 30th, but you did not. Instead, you, the UCLA leadership, and law enforcement stood by for hours as the mob of agitators gathered near the encampment with the clear intention to cause violence. And because of your inaction, they acted on the intention and brutally attacked students you were responsible for. This happened in front of your eyes, on your campus, and it was live streamed for the whole world to see. You played right into the hands in laying the ground for attacking institutions of public education, stripping students of their rights, and broader repression of movements. I know that my time is up. I would like to submit these images into the record. Without objection. And an open letter to the UCLA community from the UCLA Jewish faculty and staff. Madam Speaker, I rise in opposition to the Pregnant Student Rights Act, which fails to expand meaningful support and accommodation for students. As a pregnant and parent college student, I have personal experience when it comes to this topic. When I was 19 and in college, I became pregnant with my first daughter and shortly after my son. I know the challenges of navigating the education system while balancing motherhood responsibilities. I know how isolating it could be. I know how critical it is for students to have comprehensive information about choices, options, resources, and accommodations. That is why when I was in the Minnesota State Legislature, I introduced and passed a bill not only requiring institutions to provide pregnant and parent students information about their rights and resources for pre and postnatal care. It created a grant program to fund activities that support enrollment, retention, academic success, and graduation. H.R. 6914 is a do-nothing, empty messaging bill that masquerades to support pregnant and parent students but neglects their actual needs. Based on my own experience as a young mom in college and the available data, I know that pregnant and parent students need strong Title IX protections, access to affordable childcare, early education, and pre-K services, expansion of student parent programs, child-friendly study rooms, and lactation accommodation, assistance with basic needs like food, housing, transportation, supplies to ensure that these students and their families have the support they need to thrive. That is why I plan on introducing a bill. Gentlemen's time has expired. Yes, I have 30 more, 30 more seconds. 30 seconds. That's why I plan on introducing a bill that not only requires institutions to provide pregnant and parent students with comprehensive information on all of the options and resources available to them, but also increases the resources and accommodations that are necessary for them to succeed. And I hope that my friends on the other side of the aisle will help support that bill and reject the current bill that we're voting on. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Chairman. My amendment will restore the 2024 appropriation funding to, funding to the funding levels agreed to in the Fiscal Responsibility Act protecting vital economic security programs. This budget resolution would lead to dangerous cuts for social safety programs, programming that millions of our constituents rely on to meet their basic needs. Mandatory spending for income security programs, including SNAP, and TANF would be slashed by nearly a trillion dollars under this budget framework. The Women, Infant, and Children Program, which provides nutrition assistance to five million women and children, would be cut by $800 million. 
House Republicans would also cripple new affordable housing development under this proposal. Funding for home <clears throat> investment par partnership programs would be cut by nearly 70%, resulting in 20,000 view homes being constructed or renovated in communities across the country. These cuts would increase housing costs further by eliminating funding for housing choice vouchers for 20,000 households, including approximately 6,000 households headed by seniors. The added cruelty of these implicit cuts is the timing. The United States is grappling with a rising food insecurity and poverty rates as the positive impacts of past economic support, like the enhanced child tax credit, have faded. We are also dealing with affordable housing shortage. This is only getting worse in this high interest rate environment. And yet Republicans are determined to force deep cuts to programs that help keep people fed and safely housed right before the winter during these hunger and housing crises. My amendment would ensure that Congress does not leave countless Americans out in the cold without enough food to feed their families. If you care about your constituents' livelihoods and well-being, you should vote for this amendment. As a nation, we must break this cycle and return our welfare system to its original purpose as a temporary, I repeat, temporary safety net for those truly in need, not a final destination for able-bodied Americans who refuse to work. Let's end with a question on my part here. Tell me government programs that actually create the environment of a hand up, not a hand out. I believe the people of this country are dignified people. No one stands in line to get food unless they need it. No one goes through the rigorous humiliation that it takes for you to apply for welfare programs. Dignity is within people. What we are talking about is the work that we have to do here in government to try to support those who need it. I also know that there are countless members on this committee and in Congress who have had the support of government programs who are now wealthy and well off. We have to provide the bootstraps if we are saying people need to pull themselves up. Let's keep clarifying some, some points to better understand the true impacts of our immigration policies. Mr. Pierre, how has the restriction of legal pathways significantly increased reliance on asylum? Well, look, uh, you know, I mentioned 3% of the people who are going through the, the green card process get a green card each year. So that, that right there tells you we're about 97% closed. People don't look at this as an option. People are going to die in these backlogs before they get green cards. And so, yeah, they look at it and they say, there's no way. This is not an option for me. And so they come to the border and they tell us that that's why they're coming. There's no visa category available to the people who are showing up yeah. at our southwest border. Thank you for that clarity. Can you confirm that immigration policies that facilitate legal entry have reduced illegal entries, yes or no? Absolutely, the parole sponsorship programs that the administration rolled out have dramatically reduced the number of uh, encounters of, of Cubans, uh, Haitians, Nicaraguans, even Venezuelans are down compared to what they were before these, these programs were announced. Mm -hmm. And our Republican friends always say people can come here legally. Could you walk us through this um, Cato chart uh, yeah. outlining the mess that our illegal legal immigration system is? Yeah, this is why 97% of the people who go through the process get excluded, uh, because there are all these different restrictions in, in place. And you go through each one, there are multiple different categories here, obviously. Uh, refugee program, you know, you got one in, uh, out of 100 million displaced people worldwide getting in. Um, you have the diversity lottery. Again, it's a 0.2% chance of getting in through that. Family sponsorship, 9 million person backlog there. Uh, again, you're, you're going to die before you see a green card through that process. So you go through each one of these things and you, you can see how restrictive it is. Ultimately, you end up in the employer-sponsored categories. And even those, the ones that are supposed to be for skilled and uh, all about our economy and everything, even those are, are incredibly backlogged, over 2 million people waiting. Uh, for the opportunity to immigrate legally through those. Yeah. 
And finally, in terms of real costs that we should be talking about, isn't it true that immigrants generally contribute more in taxes than they consume in public benefits? That's right. Our report uh, looks at all taxes and all benefits of all categories. We look at the entire budget for state, federal, and local uh, governments, and we find $1 trillion in tax uh, payments versus uh, just $700 billion in benefits, $300 billion net gain um, from immigration. And Mr. Pierre, is it fair to say that our debate around immigration often overlooks the actual facts and data needed to craft sensible policies? Yeah, I think if we started with the, the premise that these people could be contributors, then we would ultimately craft a much more rational immigration policy than we have right now. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's about something else entirely. I won't speculate on what that something else could be, but I hope that some of my colleagues will reflect on why the idea of immigration or the changing face of our country seems to unsettle them. We know that there are undeniable benefits to immigration. The real costs are rooted in poor policy decisions. Our restrictive and failed immigration policies are costing us not just economically and, and fiscally, but also harming global standing and dividing our communities. With something as complex as immigration, this discussion merits thoughtful consideration and not whatever this hearing is about. This debate today, it's about who gets to be an American. What opinions do we get to have, do we have to have to be counted as Americans? This is what this debate is about, Madam Speaker. There is this idea that you are a suspect if you are an immigrant, or if you are from certain parts of the world, or a certain skin tone, or a Muslim. It is no accident that members of the Republican Party accuse the first black president, Barack Obama, of being a secret Muslim. It is no accident that former President Donald Trump led a birther movement that falsely claimed he was born in Kenya. Because to them, falsely labeling the first and only president of the United States of America, a Muslim and African immigrant, somehow made him less American. Well, I am Muslim. I am an immigrant, and interestingly, from Africa. Is anyone surprised that I am being targeted? Is anyone surprised that I am somehow deemed unworthy to speak about American foreign policy? Or that they see me as a powerful voice that needs to be silenced? Frankly, it is expected. Because when you push power, power pushes back. Representation matters. Continuing to expand our ideas of who is American and who can partake in the American experience, experiment, is a good thing. I am an American. An American who was sent here, an American who was sent here by her constituents to represent them in Congress. A refugee who survived the horrors of a civil war. Someone who spent her childhood in a refugee camp. Someone who knows what it means to have a shot at a better life here in the United States, and someone who believes in the American dream and the American possibility and the promise and the ability to participate in the democratic process. That is what this debate is about. There is an idea out there that I am not, that I do not have objective decision making because of who I am, where I come from, and my perspective. But I reject that. We say there is nothing objective about policy making. We all inject our perspective, our point of views, our lived experiences, and the voices of our constituents. That's what democracy is about. So what is the work of the Foreign Affairs Committee? It is not to co-sign the stated foreign policy of whatever administration is in power. It's about oversight. It's to critique and to advocate for a better path forward. But most importantly, it is to make the myth 
that American foreign policy is intrinsically moral a reality. So I will continue to speak up because representation matters. I will continue to speak up for little kids who wonder who's speaking up for them. I will continue to speak up for families around the world who are seeking justice. Whether they are displaced in refugee camps or they are hiding under their beds somewhere like I was, waiting for the bullets to stop. Because this child survivor of war would have wanted that. The nine-year-old me would be disappointed if I didn't talk about the victims of conflict, those that are experiencing unjust wars, atrocities, ethnic cleansing, occupation, or displacement like I did. They are looking to the international community and the United States, asking for help. They look to us because the international community and the United States profess the values of protecting human rights and upholding international law. So we owe it to them not to make this a myth, but a reality. I didn't come to Congress to be silent. I came to Congress to be their voice. And my leadership and voice will not be diminished. For a long time, Republicans spent so much time saying they were going to address the economic anxiety families were feeling. But overnight, they dreamt up a dangerous economic bill that will blunch families into economic depression. They talk nonstop about rail safety, yet in this bill, it would cut at least 160 rail inspection days in Minnesota and cut 7,000 inspections nationwide. They are not repealing the Bush Trump tax cuts because what their bill is going to do is do wealth transfer from working and middle class families to billionaires <coughs> and millionaires. Time has expired. This is hypocrisy and is full of Gentlewoman's lies. Time has expired. Corporations should not be put ahead Gentleman of our families.